Today, I'm here with Rashad Robinson, a highly respected civil rights leader, human rights advocate, blogger, author, and president of Color of Change, the nation's largest online civil rights organization. Rashad, thanks so much for coming and welcome to Underlying Conditions. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you, only virtually. <laughs> yes, I know. We're all in a virtual world. So um, I want to just focus in on some really interesting things that you've been working on. Um, you know, there have been so many dimensions of the devastation due to COVID, and nearly every day new facets related to these underlying conditions for vulnerable communities are being revealed. So, you know, we see how Black people are dying disproportionately, health conditions, consequences, racialized mass incarceration. But when it comes to the shuttered economy, few are talking about Black small businesses. Color of Change, as I, you know, of course, recently launched a small Black business-focused campaign. And the email from Color of Change painted a vivid and also a personal portrait about the importance of small Black businesses and the, also their significant vulnerability, especially during a crisis like this. Can you share the outline of that campaign and what motivated you to focus on the race components of the shuttered economy? Well, a couple of things, um, you know, the, the overall campaign is trying to find um, avenues to protect black businesses, to ensure that the pillars and institutions in our community uh, that create um, a lifeline, that create opportunity, that create connection um, are here. Um, after this crisis is over and through this crisis. And, you know, one of the things that we really noticed, and this is why um, having racial justice at the center of our policy work, not thinking about racial justice as charity or an afterthought or something we put on the side, but having racial justice as center is really important. It's because when the first CARES Act came out that had the sort of, that had the protections around small businesses, all the money was put through the Small Business Administration, which effectively put the big banks as intermediaries between businesses that wanted to access money and, um, and the actual resources. And so what ended up happening was that businesses in our community simply do not have relationships with the big banks. That has been sort of decades upon decades long issues ever since civil rights and the ways that banking policy has happened. But ever since 2008, and the downturn, um, the relationships between our communities and banks have become even tougher. So mm. having big banks in between that money made it almost impossible for mm. so many of our communities to even access it. Also right. making this money loans, where folks would be on the hook months or years from now, um, right. also wasn't a situation. And so what we needed was a policy solution that worked, not simply overlaying things to say, we're gonna try to make sure this bad policy works for black and brown people, but how do we actually create policies that work? And so right. part of what we're doing, um, and part of actually what we first tried to do was figure out how we could help black businesses get these loans. We actually right. talked to a number of economists and, and tried to create a situation, had phil philanthropy willing to invest in a program that we built to help folks get these loans. What we realized was that the policy wasn't actually designed to work in the first place. And trying to help people win at a game that was rigged was mm -hmm. not worth our energy and time. And so, so right now we are fighting to fix the problem. Right, right. Well, rewind a little bit about, just to unpack for people who may not have the uh, level of detail that you obviously have, what are the reasons and re why we don't have relationship with the Small uh, Business Administration? Well, you know, for, for lots of Black businesses, the sort of pathway to getting to opening oftentimes it looks very different than white businesses. It doesn't oftentimes involve the bank because we don't oftentimes end up with that type of collateral. Um, folks or folks are sort of uh, mortgaging a home, taking a loan out from a pam parent, um, leveraging money from maybe a deceased relative, and then starting a business and putting it into that business. It means that they don't have the sort of uh, traditional sort of uh, lines of credit with the banks. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we are banking at smaller institutions um, or we were banking at smaller institutions until many of them went away in 2008. Um, our relationship with big banks means that we're not going to be prioritized oftentimes when these 
bills come, when these come down, because they are prioritizing bigger companies. They're prioritizing um, companies that have been with them longer, that have um, many different mm -hmm. forms of collateral. And so the history of wealth generation and the exclusion of from being able to gain wealth, all the ways in which we've invested in homes and then only to have our communities redlined. Um, we've invested in homes only to have banks um, sort of sell us on mortgages that um, you know, were predatory and created um, sort of in situations where we were losing our homes. All of this creates a situation where the rules have then been, that we have been um, targeted not vulnerable, but targeted. And then once we're targeted and hurt, then the rules are set up in such a way that the ways in which we are targeted becomes the sort of um, the tool to exclude us. And so the, it's all very active, right? And in some ways, right. um, it gets oftentimes described as unfortunate, like a car accident. Yeah. Uh, when in fact, it actually is sort of an active set of, of rules that have been tailored in design to exclude Black people from these gifts, from these opportunities. And this exclusion becomes a vicious cycle. Once you get excluded from one thing, then you become more likely to be excluded from the next. Exactly, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so have you heard any reports or stories about how the stimulus package has been distributed or not distributed based on race at this point? So what we're hearing from some, you know, just early numbers is that actually everyone is having a problem with the mm -hmm. loan, the loan issue and that sort of, um, you know, we're at sort of 80 to 85 percent of small businesses in total are having sort of deep problems, couldn't exact, couldn't. Mm -hmm. Um, access it. We're seeing those numbers for black and brown businesses being, you know, closer to 90, 95%. Um, it's why, you know, we are supporting um, efforts to actually move from loans to grants uh, mm -hmm. as a way. And, and we see other countries that are recovering from this, you know, places in Europe, particularly that are moving from a loan-based program to a grant-based program. And the grant-based program that actually, you know, makes sure that one way or the other, people are going to be paid, right? And so whether or not people are paid to stay on payrolls or people are paid to go on unemployment, you know, we invest actually in the businesses by keeping those businesses afloat and being able to ensure that once, the, once we recover to a point where those businesses can reopen, that people are connected to employment, not, right. not, not disconnected from employment. Right. Part of this is just common sense, but because we have a strategy of bailing out um, uh, big corporations and mm -hmm. forcing small businesses to kind of take out loans and sort of uh, forge it on their own, uh, we just have a set of misplaced priorities. And right. part of the kind of work that we have to do is um, really the kind of organizing and advocacy to tell a new story. And so part of what we're also just trying to do is narrate a different kind of story, one that once again, doesn't talk about these issues as, um, as passive, but talks about the structural challenges that Black people face as active, right? Black people um, are not 30% less likely to get loans from banks. Banks are 30% less more likely to exclude Black people from those loans. That is sort of a way in which we're also trying to build more power around who's to blame and as a result, what we do about it. Right, right. And so in telling that story that you're revising, um, you also, I think, want to emphasize from your campaign, you know, how the sort of, uh, you know, the, the uniquely significant role that Black businesses play in fragile Black communities, which is, you know, obviously socially produced fragility. Um, but you talk a little bit about your own story, about your father and his business, you know, which isn't just a one person story, but it is a one person story, but it retells the whole situation. Can you share it just a little bit here? give a sense of the, the importance of Black businesses. Yeah, I mean, so about five years before I was born, my father um, was, um, you know, working, working for a boss. He had gotten into a union, learned a trade, and he decided to forge out on his own and open his own business. And, um, and a couple of years in, he met my mom. And, um, and, and, and I was then born, and they, you know, they got married. I was born. And, um, and then, you know, my mom 
um, you know, gave up the work that she was doing to be part of the business. To hit that, and the two of them together really built um, a construction company, a business that was focused on high-end homes on Eastern Long Island. And my dad is a tradesman; he does uh, uh, ceramic tile, marble, granite, um, stonework, in, in very nice homes like Diana Ross's summer home and L.A. Reid's summer home. And um, and I, you know, over the summers would go to work with him, um, carry cement buckets sometimes in homes of people that I have since like <laughs> sat behind at the opera at the Met and, and had conversations when they said oh I enjoy your work and I'm like oh yes well I carried cement buckets in your summer home um, <laughs> and but that job right that um, my my job working for my dad you know, I got the inside look of what it meant to like for the buck to stop with you, um, to to watch the ways in which you know um, they would they would address, people on the job would sometimes address his white foreman and think that he was the boss, um, and you know my dad would sort of laugh, um, and the you know the foreman got used to it um, and thought it was weird, but also you know kind of. They had a they had sort of a way of, of navigating navigating those right. things, but all of the slights and all of those things were one thing. But the other thing was the pride in having the trucks that had his name on it. The the waking up and each day and being your own boss. The the pathway it created when um, family members might have lost their job and they knew they could maybe get some hours with right. my dad. The right. all the ways in which that family business became not mm -hmm. just a, a vehicle for our own pathway from working class to middle class, but it became um, a symbol for our family. Of, yeah. of opportunity. And when some communities have that opportunity to build something and to grow something and other communities don't, um, I think about my own pathway right. of running something now, of waking up every day and knowing what it's like to run something. I think about my brother that has his own contracting company in Vermont and does ceramic tile because he enjoyed mm -hmm. carrying the cement buckets a little more than I did. <laughs> um, and, um, and for both of us, what it meant to have um, the opportunity to be entrepreneurs and to think from an entrepreneurial standpoint and and yeah. um, and that right is also how structures can collude to prevent people from all the gifts and opportunities that um, society is supposed to afford us. Yeah, yeah, that's so important. And you know, I think in keeping with both the specific piece of the story you're telling about your dad, but also the notion of the need to retell these stories. You know, I, I worry about you know, the, the ways in which we'll tell the story of the demise of black businesses during COVID in the future, right? Well, they must not have been very uh, responsible or they must not have been on sure enough footing and as if all of the reasons for the exclusion and the, you know, the, the decline and the loss of those businesses were the result of the individual communities themselves, you know? So I'm really interested in thinking about how we can use this reframing to to impact the way we tell the stories about, about the crisis that we know is, is gonna be coming, right? Yeah, and, and this question of shore footing is such a sort of interesting one, right? When we're constantly bailing out airline industries, when we're constantly bailing out banks, companies mm -hmm. with billions and billions of dollars and seem to not have any savings, right? And right. then we're like, questioning um, the sort of idea of entrepreneurship in this country, which is about right. taking risk, which is about betting on yourself. And then people bet on themselves. And what's, what is done is that the rug is pulled out from them, not because of the choices they made, because of a set of societal choices that have, um, and decisions that have been made, because of bad decisions before crisis and bad decisions after. But you know, right. folks, um, you know, um, are not um, asking banks oftentimes. And in 2008, when black home ownership was really decimated in this country, that wasn't, um, you know, we didn't bail out people, homeowners, right? And keep people in their no, homes. we bailed out banks. banks. And so time and time again, we will, um, we will uh, trust those folks that continue to make big mistakes and big mistakes that have huge, impact on our, our community and our lives. And we will um, punish those who at the day-to-day -day level are simply trying to provide. 
Right, right. So what what can we do and, and what are you doing instead of, as you mentioned much earlier in our conversation, you know, instead of trying to make the program work, right, what are the ways in which you're trying to build alternatives or how can people who might want to focus or get involved in, in coming up with, you know, these kinds of infrastructures? And let me just say very quickly, this is going to be critical because if these businesses fail en masse, not just black businesses, but small businesses at large, but of course black ones in black communities, because we know the segregation of who can serve a black community and where black businesses can be. Um, but this is going to be a tremendous crisis for the, you know, the economy and unemployment in, in black communities. So it's important that we do the best we can. What, what are some of the alternatives that we have to the plans that are currently going underway? Well, there is a, um, there's a piece of legislation that's sponsored by Pramila Jayapal that really does look at um, payroll protection and looks at a model of removing the big banks as the middle, as the, mm -hmm. as the middle man. And, and um, you know, we are very much in support of that. Um, we have been um, in support of running the money directly through the IRS or through community banking trust. Um, in both situations, those will be avenues where we can get the money more directly to people and we'll also be able to more effectively monitor sort of the ways in which from a race and other perspective, the uh, policies are rolling out. We also need data collection on all of these things on the front end and the back end to both um, create transparency and sunlight into how decisions are being made, but to give us the advocacy tools to effectively know how to push on the back end when the problems exist. Um, and so there's a lot of work on sort of disparities and on tracking across health and economics that you know have been coming from Senator Warren, uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and others. And so there's a set of things that um, are happening. We've very much been engaged with, you know, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, members of the, Com the Progressive Caucus. I'm, you know, meeting with Senator Schumer later this week. And, you know, all of those are part of how we are trying to both elevate and build power around this. But if folks go to theblackresponse.org, which is www theblackresponse.org. That is the place where people can join us in taking action. And they can particularly take action on this effort around small businesses, where we are trying to build as much power. Part of what we are trying to do from now until uh, the House of Representatives introduces the next kind of version of the CARES Act um, is to fight for as much um, resources to our businesses and a change to the actual policy for them. So they're not just adding money onto a bad system, but they're redesigning the system so it actually affects, um, um, it act, the money actually gets down to the ground. So often, um, uh, you know, folks try to uh, solve racial disparities or racial challenges with um, adding on to flawed programs instead of redesigning a new yeah. program. And part of what we are trying to do, and you know, we are definitely being heard right now, and right, and we are working with economists to prove that all of this can work. And we are in a, and the more people's voices and the more visibility around it, uh, the thing that we're oftentimes up against, right, is that when there's a bailout from the, from Wall Street, when there's a bailout for big business, people will say, "Oh, we'll do it, and then we'll figure it all out later." Right. When we're trying to figure out how to bail out black small businesses, we have to be able to explain in every every single, dollar, <laughs> every single dollar in detail. And so, you before, know, before the first before check, before the first thing happens, and not say, okay, let's let's keep this as the north star, and let's get smart people in the room. And so we are. That is the that is both the urgency that I I'm in and. And, you know, and to be perfectly honest, as the leader of the organization, I'm very clear about where I stop and start and even where my organization stops and starts. And so we are working with economists and experts and people who wake up every single day studying these things to help us figure out where to go. And then our job is really to help um, describe it, to build power around it, and then to direct the right level of pressure at those right. points. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is fantastic, Rashad. Thank you so much for making time to join us here. You know, this is the kind of thing that I think we need to really think about. These crises, like really the origin of Color of Change with Hurricane Katrina, become these watershed moments where we have the potential to really make a change and, and hopefully change the infrastructure as well as the thinking. And you're at the forefront of that. So we're really grateful for you joining us and we hope we'll see you again soon. I look forward to it. Thanks for having me.